Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Writer's Chat, where we talk about all things writing for writers, about writers, just anything that has to do with writing. Here's where you can find information, and we just love to have you with us. If you're watching on the replay, we're glad that you're doing that too. We have a very special guest this morning, but first, I'm Johnny Alexander, really glad to be here as your host this morning, joined by my co-host and daughter, Bethany Chat. And I'm going to turn it over to Bethany to introduce our very special guest. Yay! I'm very excited to introduce my friend. Uh, James L. Rubart is how you'll find him online and um, in his amazing books. He's a multiple award-winning author and just incredible. And what's, what I love about Jim is that he not only can he write extremely well, but then he also has this passion for marketing. Um, and we were at a conference together in like the lobby area and Jim and I were just talking and chatting and all of a sudden one of us says like some like obscure marketing term and all of a sudden it was like, oh, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> and then a friendship was born. <laughs> but I love Jim and um, reading Jim's bio on his website is one of the best bios ever. So we're going to make sure we get his URL in the chat so you guys can check it out. But it's interesting as we've talked on Writer's Chat before where people have like discouraged your dream because like you get, Jim, you were rejected I think, from the school paper or when you were in middle school and then like the dream oh. died a little bit. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, right. oh. I know, you should never stop writing. So um, that, I may have botched Jim's bio, but I'm gonna let him come on here. He's, he also does the novel marketing podcast with uh, Thomas Umstead Jr. He's got courses that are happening right now, retreats and conference. I mean, he's just incredible. So Jim, welcome. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you have um talking about your retreat i've been listening to the podcast and i know that you have a, a retreat coming up and it's very limited spacing do you still have spaces available yeah we do still have a few spaces available okay. and they are filling up uh so it's only nine people and it's this october 25th through the 28th and these things have blown my mind I, taylor and i i'm doing it with my son i don't know if you guys know about a mother-daughter type <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how cool that is, right? How yeah. cool that is. Um, but yeah, Taylor and I are doing it together, and we, we've done three so far. And you really don't know what it's going to be until you actually do it. You guys understand that, and the responses from people have been, oh my gosh, they're just calling it life altering and, and the, the most they put their money on. And so it's been really fun to do it with Taylor. And yes, we have another live event coming up October twenty fifth through the twenty eighth, and. If people want more info on it, they can go to rubartwritingacademy.com. Sounds wonderful. Put that in the chat right now. Yeah. I just finished your book, Rooms. Oh, no, you did? Chairs. I read Chairs. <laughs> chair. The Chair. Chair. The Chair. <laughs> <laughs> you should have, like, put on record <laughs> a bit of, like, Chair. And I want, I want to tell everybody, if you've not read one of Jim's books, you have to Go to the library, get it on Amazon, go to Barnes and Noble and get it because you're, I felt like this is gonna sound crazy, but I feel like my mind and my heart just met in the middle throughout all the pages. Yeah. Because like, this is a book like you can't you can't put it down, but then also you're thinking the whole time. It's like this little thing is like churning in the back. It's incredible. It's an incredible way to write and like I don't know. I just I loved it every every page of it. Thank you so much. That's Thank you. All right, today's topic, copywriting. Copywriting. <laughs> yes. Where do we begin? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, talk, we can talk about copywriting in general. We can talk about copywriting specific. This might be really helpful to your viewers and, 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 and folks who will see this in the replay. We could talk about how do you write effective back cover copy? Because yeah. there's a lot of indie authors out there that are doing their own books, and it's like, okay, how do I, how do I do this? Because it's interesting because you have a uh, a fair number of professional copywriters that have moved into uh -oh. this person is an example of somebody who's extremely successfully done that. But you don't have a lot of literary people that have moved into copywriting. It's just, it's, it's a hard skill to learn. It, it, it doesn't come naturally. So um, it's a skill that I think is worth studying if you're an indie author. It's absolutely, I guess that's why you're having me on the program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, it's not easy, but it's extremely valuable if you can learn how to do it. 
And we probably should go ahead and make the distinction that we're not talking about copyrights as in right. protecting your material. Because we had uh, Tamsin, who's my uh, lawyer friend of ours, come on and talk about trademarks and, and that. Okay, so, okay, so, okay, so it sounds like effective back cover copy and doing that, especially as indie authors, is something we need to cover. And then at some point, I do want to talk about social media and how, like, you are copyright, you can take content from your blog and then copywriting comes into play when you're putting it on the appropriate platforms, too. So I want to make sure we touch on on that, even if it's at the end. Okay. Oh, okay. So just make, let me make a quick comment about that. Bethany is so right about that. She's so exactly right. <laughs> you're writing, a, you're writing a, a, a comment in an email or you're writing a comment on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or anything. That is all copywriting. And there's yeah. things that you want to do and there's things that you don't want to do with regard to that. So yes, copywriting is not just writing an ad or writing back cover copy. Best to think of copywriting as anything you write down anywhere. I like that. Yeah, and that's what Melissa just put in the chat. So should we define copywriting for those unfamiliar with the term? And I think we just kind of covered that a little bit. It's just, it's not just ad copy. It's, it's whatever we're putting out there that's going to reflect on who we are. Yeah, that's, that's a great way, Johnny, to say it. The, the strict definition of copywriting is more for ads. Copywriting is mm -hmm. marketing, writing marketing words, words that will market and sell and promote your products. However, in the expanded definition, certainly as authors, we need to think of everything we are doing as copywriting. Because when we say something on Facebook that's engaging, that can be persuasive copywriting. And if we say something that's boring, what happens? <laughs> We're ignored, right? Yeah. And so l let me give you a small example of copywriting on Facebook. All of us, I assume, in this room have birthdays. And when your birthday comes up on Facebook, you get a lot of people writing to you, happy birthday. The majority of people write, happy birthday. Hope you have a great day. Um, you know, <laughs> Guilty. That's, Guilty. <laughs> Guilty, yeah. And that is boring, boring, boring copyright. <laughs> it just, ah! So if instead you write something like, way to go, another year younger, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a little different. And so it stands. Uh -oh, yeah, I I'll just go with that as an example. <clears throat> that's really... <laughs> That's a really, really good example. Um, so, do I don't even know what I want to say. Do we just really need to have our own brand in mind as we're going forward then? Or is that where we start with this? Or do we just, I mean, how do we put our personality and all that into what we write on Facebook and Twitter and all those kinds of things without being obnoxious about it? It is kind of your voice, don't you think? Yeah. Absolutely. It's a voice there. Absolutely. It's, it is, it's your voice. And in my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my definition of voice in terms of writing is very, very simple. A lot of people make it uh, more complex than I can make it. And I just say voice, whether you're writing a novel or you're writing a blog post or you're writing a comment on Facebook is your personality on the page, your personality in words. And a lot of times we revert back to our English um, <laughs> our English teacher in high school telling us how to write, we revert back to that type of writing when we're writing a blog post or we're writing a Facebook or Twitter or anything else. And consequently, it becomes very stiff and stoic and boring. What we need to try to push into is, how would I say this if I was just talking to a friend? Mm -hmm. Right? Not anything I was going to write down, but just f f fun banter. And then the next step, on that is oh I wouldn't say happy birthday like that I'd go oh my gosh I cannot you rock I can't believe you made it another year <laughs> hope it was you know I hope it was freaking awesome that's what you'd probably say yes and then you take that and then you actually edit that and you make it even better because when we write our editors and our agents and and our fellow writers tell us you got to go back and stop making that cliche. You got Johnny, you got a cliche thing going on here and you go, Oh, you're right. I do. And you make it better. We do that in our books. Well, we have to do it even in our, in our social media posts, our blog posts, everything we do, we need to 
edit it before we publish it because we're different than ordinary people, right? Everything we do yeah, really? represents, yeah, we're different, all right. <laughs> we're way different. <laughs> As Brandilyn Collins, she was the first one who I heard say this, where she goes, now in the hotel, remember, we're, we're guests here like everybody else, so please be kind to the normals. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. So, so whereas the normals, they're they're they are not promoting themselves in every moment, but we are. We we are in a weird way. We're public figures. <clears throat> wow, that's kind of scary. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was really interested in what you said about that. How literary people don't often naturally go into to copywriting and and i this may sound really weird but do you think part of that though is because we think we can do it so we don't realize how bad we are at it because we're net we're naturally good at words so do we just sort of think we're good even though we're not <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to copywriting so that we just sort of you know we don't realize that we're not doing it right that's a really good question i think potentially Johnny <clears throat> you could be right that we figure well I know how to write a 90,000 word novel exactly. wow. how hard could a back cover me yeah 150 <laughs> words in the back cover that's 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 not gonna be a problem and yet the principle the the uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who might have said this uh, I'm gonna quote this wrong but when he was he when he was asked to give a speech one time he said um, how long is the speech yeah and and I'm butchering this anecdote, but you guys are familiar with it. And for those of you who aren't, Churchill says, if you need me to speak for six hours, I'm ready to go right now. If you need me to speak for an hour, it's you know, going to take me a few days to, try, to, to prepare. If you want me to speak for 20 minutes, well, that's going to take me two weeks. It's like, what? Yeah. And the whole point is narrowing that, for example, back cover copy, narrowing that down so every single word works that's that's a craft and that takes time and we think because we're writers we can do it but it is a different craft it's a different approach than writing than writing long form than writing a novel i think one thing too okay so um if you've ever been so i want to know like if you're in the chat and you've been to one of you know a conference or heard jim on the podcast like let us know but um i was privileged to sit in one of your classes at a conference and you were talking about uh the reader and the hero's journey and how everything is about your reader and your audience and it is never about you yeah. so can we dive in there because i do you agree that that's a big mindset shift when it comes to copywriting like on socials like kind of where i'm at right now with this yeah. um it's all about them like if you can put them into the place of your situation then they own it with you and then you get a ton more engagement on your statuses like instead of saying i dropped my coffee it's like the moment when you drop your coffee after you dropped your kids off of, you know from school and now you're having a bad day like they're not having that happen you are but you just made it about them and now they're like oh i get it can we talk about the hero's journey and like start that whole like you mindset that you that you That's a good idea so beautifully yeah absolutely and for those of you who didn't catch that because <clears throat> It went by quickly. I speak quickly as well. Um, <laughs> you, no, seriously, you just made an excellent point. Just that subtle shift in the way you said that. I dropped my coffee to, have you ever dropped your coffee? That's a subtle shift, but it's, it's a huge shift because it's about them now. It engages them. And when we get letters from readers that say, oh my gosh, your book knocked me out, often along with that will be, I felt like I was the character. Or I can relate so much to the character. So yes, you've made it about them. And so with regard to our books, we want to make the reader feel like they're one of the characters. To your point, Bethany, it, it applies to our social media and our copywriting, where again, we make it about them. And the quintessential example of this that I use, and I got this idea from Don Miller, is Star Wars, where Oh, the story is in Star Wars, the first movie, the one that kicked it all off, 99.9% <clears throat> of the people will say uh, Luke Skywalker is the hero of the story. And then we say, well, who's the guide? <clears throat> well, that's Obi-Wan Kenobi. He is the guide and he guides and he's the mentor to Luke. And then when you say, okay, apply that story to your own story, 
who are you in the story? People go, well, I'm Luke. I'm, I'm the hero of the story. It, my website's about me and it's about my books and this kind of thing. And the fundamental shift that's really hard for people to grasp is no, 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 no. Your, your reader is Luke uh -huh. and you are Obi-Wan Kenobi and you are guiding them. You want to get out of the way. And we see this, we see this in people we admire. The person that we just drives us nuts is the one that's always gotta be telling the story about her or him and making it all about, well, I've got a story I wanna tell you when I, no, it's the, the person we admire is the person who's always handing off to somebody else. And it's like, but then you tell that story, Johnny, you tell that story, Melissa, gosh, I'd love to hear your, your story. And after we're with people like that, it's like, oh, they're so great. They're so great. Yeah. Well, what did you learn about them? Um, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and how do you know they're great? Because they made it about me. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And that even goes back in like our websites are copywriting. I mean, you know, so it's like again, every, every, every little, every, not every little thing, everything that we're we're doing. Yeah, and that speaking of copywriting and websites, this is is an area that I'm very passionate about because as you guys no, a Facebook page <clears throat> or a Twitter account or Instagram or any of those things, th that's, they're giving us free rent on those platforms. Mm -hmm. Very nice of them to give free rent. And we don't always like what they do, but it's, it's free. It's theirs. The only piece of real estate that we're not renting that we own is our website. And so consequently, that needs to be the hub of everything we do. And consequently, <clears throat> we need the content, the copy on that to be absolutely excellent. And what I find is there's a lot of authors that go, yeah, I know I need a good website. I know I need a good website. So they go out and they pay somebody to do this beautiful looking website. But the content, the copy is still really poor and it's all about them. And somebody comes to this site and goes, wow, that's gorgeous. And then they never come back because it's not about them. And that's why I encourage people, gosh, hire somebody that know, or knows copywriting or devote yourself to really studying the craft of copywriting so that those words on that website truly engage your reader. Can you give a couple um, hints or tips for somebody who may just not feel like they have the budget to hire someone? What should they be trying to put it into their words to make it more reader focused? and make that mind shift. Yeah. Um, well, the answer you're not going to want to hear is probably the most efficient thing to do is spend the money and just go, because we pay for what we think is valuable, right? Yes. <laughs> it's like, Bethany, right now, what are you doing? You're spending money yeah. to be away in an environment. And I don't know what it is a night for you it's Michelle, I think you're doing this with, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's costing you a night to do this, but you're going, well, this is worth it because it puts us in an environment where we can absolutely focus and write. And somebody else who's kind of dabbling in writing would go, I'm not spending that kind of money. We can just meet in the library or we can meet, you know, in my spare bedroom or whatever. No, you're committed to it. And so people spend money on what they feel is valuable. And in the case of copywriting, everyone, again, thinks, well, that's not that important. That's just, that's just a little piece of the puzzle. The real puzzle is, you know, going to a writing conference or the real puzzle is getting that beautiful graphic design. They don't understand how important it is. But that aside, Johnny, what if somebody says, yeah, well, I'm still not sure, Jim. Yeah. Well, then I would say, okay, great. Become a student of copywriting. And by that, I mean, there are a huge number of resources out there for free, right? Okay. On the internet where you can, you can type in how to copyright, how to write website copy. Um, <clears throat> and then you become a student of it. And I will say this, there's a lot of horrible information out there too. I've Googled copywriting where I go, this isn't right. This isn't right. This mm -hmm. is not going to help you. And so just because it's out there doesn't mean it's correct. And you guys know this. All of a sudden, everybody's a writing expert. All of a sudden, <laughs> Well, I'm a social media guru. How long have you been doing it? I've been doing it six months. Okay. <laughs> I know it all. <laughs> yeah. so, so I would say become, commit, say, I'm going to study copywriting five hours a week. Um, how, I'll tell you how I became a great copywriter. Um, I did it for 20 years. <laughs> That's all, you know? It's just... <laughs> It takes time, like any craft, any craft. Um, so number one, I'd say 
I'd suggest you pay for it. But even if you do pay for it, I would suggest people study copywriting because you're going to be able to work better with your copywriter if, yeah. if, you, if you understand that. So Is I would there... say it's probably the area where um, it's the, the most neglected and one of the most essential to your career. <clears throat> Is there a book that you do recommend on copywriting or to get started? I, mean, I have so many different books. I, there's not one that stands out in my mind. And I, I uh, with copywriting, I'm a little bit suffering the curse of knowledge where yeah. I've done it for so long and it comes so naturally to me now, not then, but mm -hmm. comes so naturally to me now. I, I, I have to actually think about the techniques I use. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys get that, but use. Yeah. So consequently, there's no books that I have currently where I What was the term yeah, you, you said, um, what was that term that you just said, like, um, about like, it's, it comes so naturally now to you. Oh, it's innate. It's oh, the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge. That's it. I want to write that down. The curse yeah. Of knowledge. Yeah. Because you do, you do something so long and it's like, well, how do you do that? And it's like, well, I don't really know. It just sort of <laughs> flows. Yeah. I mean, it's something yeah. where. Uh, let's use an example. If you, if, if I said to you guys, I came to you guys and I said, all right, I really, uh, teach me how to put makeup on. I, I have no idea. I've never done it before in my life. I don't have any idea where to start. You guys would start teaching me <clears throat> and you would do things and say things. It's like, what? I, I don't understand that. I don't well, get it. Yeah. What do you mean? Of course you put foundation on. Well, <laughs> what's foundation, right? <laughs> so that's the curse of knowledge. You, you just, it comes so naturally to you. Mm -hmm. It comes to I'm a big fan of, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, Jim. I'm a big fan of testing, like within the boundaries of your audience. Like once you know who your market is and who you're talking to, I do a lot of testing with my, and again, I'm always going to go back to social, so we don't have to stay there. We can, I mean, I know I'm going to say it, yeah, but. We want to talk about that copy boards too a little bit. Yes. Yeah. So do you find yourself testing like within your audience, even if, let's say even email marketing, like you're going to. A B splits, or you're you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna try this email here and see what hits, or see if I get reactions of people going back to my website. Okay, maybe it was the copy. Like, do you ever go back into into the things that you do and look and see and test your copy? I guess is that how you also learn? Is that one of the the ways that you're in it, like learning yourself plus learning your audience at the same time? Okay, so Bethany is talking. For those of you who don't understand this, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. No, I'm saying Bethany, like Bethany was talking about, she brings up a really, really uh, important idea, and that is A-B testing or split testing. She is, she is absolutely right on this. And she's saying she tests and sees what gets more reaction to. And for example, I use MailChimp. That's, that's my, uh, what I use as an email um, newsletter list provider and they give you the ability to a b test and there would you send one headline to one group and one headline to another group and then you go oh wow 30 percent more opens on this one that tells you something so yes yes bethany yes i encourage your viewers to do that because it gives you immediate feedback where well, you're really living in an age where you can do things that you couldn't do even, you know, 10 years ago. And in copywriting, when I started out, you just had to go, I think this is good. I don't know. Right. <laughs> um, and, and the testing was a lot harder. So these days you do have the ability to test. So yes, I would encourage that. Absolutely. <clears throat> good. I'm glad. <laughs> I think it helps you learn and grow. Like you know what your people want and then you can give them more of it, which is really what I think the heart of the marketing is altogether anyway. So right. I, Johnny, Johnny does, does Bethany know how smart she is? Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> she, yeah. Bethany's my Google. She doesn't like this. We have, I was thinking about this conversation this morning. I'm always calling up, honey, how do I, mom, did you Google it? No, because I thought you'd never do it. You just tell me. Well, when I need to know something, I look at YouTube. <laughs> and the other day we were on the phone and I said, Bethany, you are my Google. <laughs> oh, I love that. Love I'm going to have to get a shirt. My mom's Google. <laughs> my mom's Google. She is. But yeah, she, she's amazing. And, and I really appreciate 
her help <laughs> when I need it. Um, I, headlines, I mean, just talking about that, I'm doing my first newsletter in like a year. So I'm sort of relaunching this and I'm really excited about it. I finally figured out format. I've got, I'm like real, really excited, but I'm stumped about that subject line because these are people, unfortunately most of them are friends, but they haven't heard from me in forever. And it's like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what the subject line <laughs> needs to be. So I've got this, I think I've got good text. I've worked on that. Good copy in the newsletter. Yeah. But what's well, the okay, subject when line it, when, people will open it? When it comes to, and you guys have heard me talk about this, and we've talked one-on-one -on -one about this, so you really understand this concept of shocking. Yes. A particular area of our brain called Broca, which is the yes. filter, right? Broca filters out <clears throat> the boring and the mundane. And so when it comes to headlines, I would say push the envelope, push the envelope. And that's an encouragement to all your view viewers when you're writing headlines and even when you're writing content, push the envelope, make yourself uncomfortable by what you're saying. We all have this idea of, no, I need to be polite. We were taught, don't ruffle feathers. Uh, I mean, that's what we were taught, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's what we were taught. And, and uh, it, not to get political on you or anything, but <laughs> the person who ruffles the most feathers gets the most attention. Yeah. Yeah. And in the night, in the 19, in the 1916, in the 2016 <laughs> election on the Republican side of things, there was a candidate that ruffled so many feathers so often that he got millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of press where the other candidates were, Oh, oh yeah. Marco Rubio was there. And so was Ted Cruz, but Donald Trump, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. and, and that's not the only factor in why he won the election, but I will say he was not afraid to surprise you. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you had a headline for your rejuvenated newsletter, and this is, this, is, this is cliche, this is an example of a headline that just popped into my head. Now I need to go back and edit it. But if your headline was, I'm not dead with an exclamation point, <laughs> that would make people go, what? Yeah. Are you? <laughs> Gosh, I would have never thought of that. Wow. Wow. Because mine is really, right now, it's really dumb. I mean, it's like, especially for you, July giveaways and updates. It's like, oh, I know it's bad. It's bad. Don't be, don't be afraid to <laughs> be out there. <clears throat> okay. We're All testing right. in, in one of our brainings. I just want this on the record so years later, I can either say this was brilliant or this was the stupidest thing I've said. <laughs> <laughs> But in the Christ, so our base is the Christian market, but yet on our, what we're noticing with testing is the slightly more irreverent, not with God, but just with life that we get, the more engagement is skyrocketing. Oh, so wow. now the tricky part is how irreverent is too irreverent. <laughs> <laughs> and when you cross the line, like, you don't always come back. Wait, right? <laughs> yeah. So I love that you said that. I feel like you just gave me permission to, to, to push it even further. <laughs> so just absolutely, yeah. I give you permission to be true to yourself, right? And 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 here's the reality that we don't like to deal with. I don't like to deal with this, but it is reality. And that is, I don't care what you do, no matter what you do, no matter how you try to say, you know, stay safe and not offend here, not offend here. You are going to offend somebody. Yeah. It's just it's going to happen. Oh, she's too nice. Oh, she's too mean. It's, it's, <laughs> you just, and we are in an age um, <clears throat> of offense, I think. Oh, we, yeah. oh my gosh, as a society, we get offended by absolutely every little tiny thing, microaggression, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's some, I mean, there's some movements going on where we now can have a voice, like, for example, the Me Too movement mm -hmm. is, fantastic because it is it, you know there are some such unbelievably fantastic things going on in that movement and one of the movies of last year that was um an example was wonder woman <clears throat> and gal gadot does this amazing job it was an amazing movie i feel like it's a movie that that gave some women maybe a lot of women hope and encouragement really cool on the other hand you have gal gadot the um, star of Wonder Woman and when Stephen Hawking dies she tweets you guys probably saw this she tweets out 
thank you for all the brilliance that you've given. Um, this is a rough paraphrase. Thank you for all the brilliance that you've given us over the years. Um, uh, now you're free, right? Because he's not restrained by his wheelchair anymore. And she just got all these trolls hating on her. How can you say that? How can you say disability is a horrible thing? It's not a horrible thing. She wasn't saying that at all. But we get so offended all the time now. And so it makes us afraid to be who we truly are. But I, I guess I encourage us to continue to be who we truly are. One of the things, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and I've actually talked to Jim a little bit about this, but, you know, I think with writers, we're so introverted, and, or a lot of us are anyway, and we feel like we don't have those big personalities, we feel kind of like small and tiny. Who really wants to pay attention to, <laughs> to me and what I have to say? So, you know, how, what encouragement can you give to us just to sort of get past that and to to figure out, I guess, who we are to to be different and unique and individual? Well, that that starts, you know, it's so funny because Taylor and I have this Rubart Writing Academy, right? And, and the idea was we're going to teach you the four pillars to seeing your publishing dreams come true. We're going to teach mm -hmm. you the pillar of craft. We're going to teach you the pillar of business. We're going to teach you the pillar of marketing and branding. And we're going to teach you the pillar of inspiration and motivation. Those are the four pillars. <clears throat> what we didn't count on happening is, oh, all the, oh, by the way, we're going to start things off with kind of a, a bonus pillar called identity and mm -hmm. teach you really what your identity is, who you really are at your core. Um, we do this thing where we teach people the theme of their life, right? And, and all of a sudden that becomes a, a, the key thing that people love and take away because once you understand your true identity, and most people don't know their identities, then you can go, oh, wow, that's the space I need to write from. And so that part of the academy has become foundational to everything else. And so I guess I would say that's a long way, Johnny, of saying, first of all, you have to figure out who you are, what your true identity is, what the theme is that runs through everything else you do, it runs through all your stories, runs through all your conversations, runs through all your friendships, and once you figure that out, how you were designed, then you can write from that space. But <clears throat> there's a big mind shift that has to go on once you discover that. It's still hard to put yourself out there as an introvert, even after you know your identity. Yeah, I did. And so the mindset I try to take is, you know, I'm big on, and Bethany brought this up at the beginning, oh, don't make it all about me. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, in promoting yourself and getting past that fear, if you're fearing and you're hesitant, well, you're still making it all about you. <laughs> That's true. That's I'm true. worried about me. Oh, right. oh, you know, if, is somebody going to hurt my feelings? Me, me, me. Instead of going, you know what? I have something that I believe can encourage and inspire, mm -hmm. help other people. Therefore, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm doing it for them. And when we get that attitude, it's a lot easier to just go, well, yeah, I don't care. All mm -hmm. I care about is helping my brother and my sister. You're so right. I mean, I think that even comes like, like not doing this newsletter for so long and having the tools to do it. But just like, uh, well, you know, I don't know if people really, you know, uh, <laughs> what if I do it wrong? What if I do yeah, yeah. this up? And, There's a lot of fear, for sure. Pardon? There is a lot of fear. There I mean, is like, a lot of fear, yeah. it is scary. And we so just have to get back. Back. <laughs> yeah. And we judge ourselves. We judge ourselves yeah. all the time right? We are such harsh critics of ourselves, right? Is this going to work? Is this stupid? Is it not going to work? This is, I mean, Brit, Beth, you have this new look, right? Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love it. I just think you look fantastic, <laughs> right? But I'm sure there's, I'm sure when you were going to this new look, you were going, oh my gosh, is this going to be stupid? <laughs> are people going to think it's ugly? You know, I, you had to be thinking that, right? Yeah. For weeks. Yeah. <laughs> It's not just a day, but weeks, right? <laughs> so anytime you step out and you risk and you, but Paul, I think it is that says a life lived without faith is sin. Another way to say that is a life lived without risk is sin. You know, we're not called to live a safe life. We're really not. <laughs> I love it. I love it too. We've gotten way off copywriting, I think, but it's so it's so interesting. And it's like it's almost like a little therapy class. 
Well, it, 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 it is, you're right, Johnny, we did get off topic, but in, in, another, sense, in another sense, to really write powerful copy, you need to be freed up to go. Exactly. <laughs> I don't care what people think. Exactly. <clears throat> hey, um, go ahead, Bet. Uh, I'm John Acuff is like one of the people who ruffles feathers sometimes because he has that stuff stuff Christians like so he's literally making fun of the things that we do in the Christian world. Well, sometimes Christians can be like the worst critics of other Christians. Oh, and that's, a, that's a scary thing. So his newsletters are, are fantastic and at one point he had one um, it was a comment he just said uh, be coffee ice cream, be pistachio ice cream, don't be vanilla ice cream. It was like, it was his point. Because people who love coffee, even coffee, but or pistachio ice cream, they love it. They're all in and they don't care if you hate it, they'll eat all of it. They're just like, it's more for me. But vanilla ice cream is the people pleaser. And like, it's meh. Like, we all like vanilla. I but, love vanilla. <laughs> I, like, I feel like, okay, so here's the value, right? So you have to have some value here. The value is like, when you find things like that, I, I took a label maker and I put it right here at the top of my laptop. So every time I was on my computer, I reminded myself, okay, like with the copy, although I wasn't thinking of it as copy at the time, I have to be coffee or pistachio, not vanilla. Like I have to be coffee, not vanilla. That was the line. And so like you write the first, my first drafts are always vanilla, but you have to, I had to go back in and be like, okay, here's the coffee. So I hope that helps people. <laughs> like your second draft can be the coffee, make the first draft vanilla. Top coffee, chocolate chunk. <laughs> well, I, I love that. I love that. Someone asked if you could repeat the four pillars again that you teach in your, or that you go over in your retreat. Yeah, I, I would love to, but I, I can't. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're right, on the okay, website okay. because I saw them there. I read them there just a couple days ago. So. Okay. So, so. What I just did just there was not really conscious, but now that I think about it for half a second, that was copywriting right there. That was my personality. I was letting myself just be myself. And that's the goofy, stupid thing I would say, right? And it gets a reaction, right? It's interesting. It makes it more interesting. Just doing something as goofy as that. So that's, that's an example of copywriting. Um, and, and surprising. And here's the thing. Some people will probably get offended by me saying that. Like, <laughs> Anyway, anyway yes, so. yeah, I just fed into my fears of asking questions. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're not going to talk the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Okay, so, so the four pillars. Johnny, do not zip that lip. <laughs> so the four pillars, the four pillars to publication um, is craft. That's, that's pillar number one. The way we do it actually at the academy is we go deep into identity. Because again, we've discovered that is the foundation for everything else. And once you understand the theme of your life, oh my gosh, then everything else starts making sense. So on, on Thursday afternoon, evening, we actually go through identity and it's, oh my gosh, it's so cool. And then we get into craft. So first you have identity, then you have the pillar of craft. You have to have craft. And you have to be able to come up with unique stories that nobody else has done. And so we go deep into craft. And then the next pillar that we dive into is marketing and branding, um, which <clears throat> of course is critical. Then we go into the business side of writing. That's the third pillar because nowadays more than ever, so many authors are going indie and even traditionally published authors are going hybrid where they're doing some indie things. And so you have to understand the business side of things. Mm -hmm. And then finally we end the fourth pillar. And this is actually, I think the most important pillar. And yet I don't see it being done at writing conferences a lot. Um, and that is motivation and inspiration. Oh. How do you stay motivated to keep going on a journey? That's not easy. This thing is not easy. Not. Yeah. And so, and so we, we end with, yeah, we end with the last pillar, motivation and inspiration. Because I, of course, I'm sold on this whole thing. I'm an evangelist for seeing your publishing dream come true because mine came true. And so we're really big on helping people stay motivated. So those are the four pillars. Thank you. 
Brandon yeah. Lynn Collins mentioned that too. So we already mentioned her once. She's a, a best-selling novelist and fantastic. And you mentioned her earlier, Jim. She said that at a conference recently that when she went through like a dry spell where she had no, like the inspiration was gone, but she was under deadline for these books, that craft was the only thing that she had. And so she was talking about the importance of craft. Like if she hadn't taught her, herself and then learned that she couldn't have finished because the inspiration had dried up a little bit. So I, that's a genius. I love those four pillars. Yeah. Earlier too, just going back, um, <clears throat> you talked about shocking broca and I've heard you speak on this two or three different times, but for those yeah. of, of us, uh, those that might not have heard that expression before, could you just quickly tell what shocking broca and what broca really is? Yeah. Shocking broca is essentially getting what you say, what you write, what you speak to the front of people's brains. <clears throat> Real quickly, the front part of our brain is called the prefrontal cortex. We store our memory of sound and our memory of sight in the back part of our brain. Once that's stored, it goes on a little journey <laughs> to the front part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, where we make choices and where we make decisions. Well, in the late 1800s, this doctor and scientist, Paul Broca, discovered this area of the brain that essentially is a filter that filters out things that are boring and mundane and unusual. Um, and so consequently, a lot of what we see in here never gets to the point where we're going to make a decision on it. We have this little part of our brain that just goes boring, boring, not interesting, not interesting. And how this applies to us as writers, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you have been taught for years and years and years, that opening line of your book, oh my gosh, that has to surprise or delight or provoke or entertain readers. We go, oh, okay, okay, okay. First line, entertain. And then a really good writing teacher will say, now at the end of the chapter, you need to surprise and delight them again. So they'll go on to the next chapter. Okay, surprise, delight, provoke. And a really, really good writing teacher will say, every paragraph, every line has to surprise and delight. Right? And that's what creates a book that you can't put down. Mm -hmm. Well, that applies to every area of your life. So back to our birthday thing, if I go happy birthday on your birthday, on your timeline, it's like, <laughs> that's not getting to the prefrontal cortex. It's not surprising or delighting or provoking or shocking me. And so there, therefore it just, it's just gone. But um, if somebody says, wow, another year where you're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to surprise and delight, and that's going to go to the forefront. And so consequently, if we do this, whether you're, you're Howard Stern, I mean, there's a guy that, boy, talk about a guy that surprised, shocked, broke his area of our brain, right? Oh, my gosh. There, there's a great example. Or Lady Gaga is another example in, in, in the entertainment industry where she shocks or surprises and delights. She's just, she's a master at this. And so shocking broca, surprising broca, provoking, entertaining broca's area of the brain is essential because that's what it, what's going to get you noticed. That's what's going to get you remembered. So when Beth Wote, who I taught this idea to, goes, all right, next writing conference, I'm going to shock broca. And she took pages of her manuscript and decoupaged them onto these shoes, right? And she's wearing shoes around the conference <laughs> that have her manuscript on there. Oh, my gosh, does that surprise and delight broca? That's oh, great. are you kidding me? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And people, what are your shoes? Oh my gosh. Tell me about your shoes. And do you think that makes her stand out to editors and agents and readers? Absolutely. Oh, yes, I do. So <laughs> th there's just a million different ways to surprise and shock Broca. I, I do it when I speak. Often when I speak, I used to be a semi-pro magician. And so often when I speak, I'll do magic tricks. Well, that surprises and shocks and delights <laughs> Broca. And it makes me stand out from all the other speakers. Who's the speaker do you think they're going to remember? Exactly. You know, they're going to remember the guy who did these cool magic tricks. That's so. like Stephen James when he gets in front of the class and he throws the handouts to people. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. <laughs> and, and okay, so when Steve does that, right? <laughs> he does it with this little boy delightful smile. Yeah. He's so happy. You know, like this, and he's having a great time. And the the papers go floating down and everyone's laughing and that kind of thing. Yeah. And when they leave that class, well, how, how was Stephen James class? Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what he did. <laughs> yeah. It's brilliant. That's exactly what Steve is doing. He is surprising and delighting broke his area of the brain. And so yeah. it doesn't have to be this big, you know, flashy yeah. thing. It can be, it can be tiny things. 
So that's but, just thinking about Beth's shoes, even that's kind of a classy thing, you know, <laughs> the fashion statement. So. Yeah. yeah. And you with your hat, I mean, you have a hat on now. And I remember the first time I met you years ago, it was at a Florida Christian Writers Conference. And you wore a baseball hat. And then I think it was a couple years later, I heard you speaking and you said, I, I'm the guy with the hat. You know, that even just that was, you wore it on purpose because then you were the guy with the hat. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's different. Um, yeah. it, most guys wouldn't necessarily wear a baseball cap. Uh, Pepper um, will wear all these mm -hmm. outrageous hats. Yeah, right? I know Pepper, yeah. Because of her hats, yeah. Yeah, and you go, oh, yeah. another little hat, right? That's an example of surprising broker that Pepper does. Mm -hmm. um, and so, because a lot of people say, I'm an introvert. I couldn't do that kind of thing. Well, you can. You can do it in tiny little subtle ways as well. Um, it doesn't have to be the big flashy ways. I'd encourage, yeah, your viewers to push this concept. Everything you do, make it surprising, make it yeah. different, make it stand out. All right. Well, we're getting close to. Like, there's lots of comments and things in here too. I know there are. There, there's tons of them. Um, we let's talk very then specifically. We've talked so many about lots of different fun topics and in all about copywriting and all this. Back cover copy. Let's go back to to that where we kind of started out tips for writing great back cover copy. I know the first tip is to hire someone else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, we're done. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, real quickly, uh, back cover copy, it's, it's, I could talk for an hour just on that, uh, on back cover copy and how to do it, but just some real basic, basic, basic back cover copy fundamentals. I'll cover them real quickly and then we can, out a few minutes about any that stand out to you but first of all back cover copy really it's it's it, it is it is critical um the cover is <clears throat> on a scale of one to ten your cover is a 10 your back cover copy is a 9.9 .9 because that's what's going to get them in and so it is the ad for your book it's the foundation for your book back cover copy a lot of people try to make it too long i mean 140 to 100, 170 words that's kind of the sweet spot the other thing to think about philosophically when you're writing your back cover copy is you are setting a mood with that back cover copy. Think of movie trailers. <clears throat> a movie trailer is back cover copy for the movie. Our trailer is our back cover copy to, to mix those two um, tools to promote something in entertainment. So if you think about your back cover like a movie trailer, if it's a romance, you are not going to write it like it's a thriller. And if it's a thriller, you're not going to write it like it's a romance. And so your back cover copy is going to set the mood by the words you use. Shorter sentences work better for a thriller. We know this in terms of writing a book. Um, in terms of writing back cover copy, the same thing applies, where the language is going to set the mood. So think about setting the mood with the way you write your back cover copy. If it's a funny book, then that back cover copy better be funny yeah. yeah the next thing to think about is don't put every worm on the hook it's like okay basically a lot of people think back cover copy is simply taking the synopsis and making it really short that's not the idea the idea in catching a fish is to put one worm on the hook so that they'll bite same thing with your back cover copy you want to put enough that they'll bite but not so much that they're going well i've seen the movie now and that happens a lot with movie trailers right same thing with your book don't to put put too much on there if you could write one word and they they'd go and buy the book great use one word um <clears throat> another thing is don't bury the lead a lot of times i'm working with people on their back mm -hmm. copy and they'll come to me and i'll read 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 and then i'll be halfway down and i'll go well here's your lead that and that comes from the old newspaper journalism term don't bury the lead put that headline that most intriguing thing shock broke a surprise delight make them go what huh at, at the top um, Another thing in back cover copy is give context. People like to know where they are. So if you have this back cover copy that does not tell people that it's in the 1800s or doesn't tell people that they're on another planet, although those things would be conveyed with the, um, the cover, but you want to give some context um, of where this book is happening. Context is who, where, when, what is the conflict. You want to get to the conflict quickly because people get bored without conflict. 
You mm -hmm. want to hint at the why, the how of the story. Um, what else is important? <clears throat> well, it's what your hero is seeking, what they're after. Are they after power, acclaim, sacrifice? What is your hero after? We need to give a hint of that. Um, and then we have an invitation. And then finally, we have the twist, where at the end, I love the idea of a twist, where people are going, what? I either have to buy that book or, um, or I don't want anything to do with that book. <laughs> yeah. Real quickly, I'll give you an example from one of my own back cover copy, and I'll tell you why I did it, um, if you think that would help. Yeah, please. Okay. So this is back cover copy from my first novel, Rooms, which came out quite a while ago. Um, so the headline on that is, what would you find if you walked into the rooms of your soul? So that's my high concept, what? Where, that's my high concept pitch where people are going, if I walked into the rooms of my soul? And at that point, a lot of people are, uh, that sounds too weird for me, I'm done. The other people go, oh my gosh, what is going on? I gotta read further. So the first line is, what would you find if you walked into the rooms of your soul? One man is about to find out. He is? Okay, so that's the headline. If I've hooked you at that point with my high concept, then you're going to keep reading. The body of the back cover copy says, it was just a letter. Cryptic? Yes, absolutely. But Seattle software tycoon Micah Taylor. So now I've given you, I've given you who? My hero is Micah Taylor. I've given you where? Seattle area. And I've given you characterization. He's a software tycoon, so I know he works in the, in, in the software industry. And I kind of have a picture of who this guy is immediately. I've also said young so that people know, oh, he's um, kind of given an idea of his age. But Seattle software tycoon Micah Taylor can't get it out of his mind. The claim that a home was built for him by a great uncle he never knew. So if this is invitation. There's this home that was built for him. He never knew the guy who built it, but it's an invitation to come to this home. So as a reader, we're invited to, ooh, I'd like to go see what that home's all about. And then it says, on the Oregon coast. Again, I'm giving you setting. I'm giving you where. And then I say, the one place he loves, the one place he never wants to see again. Now I've given you some backstory. Oh, apparently he's been down there before. And I've given you mystery and intrigue. Why doesn't he want to go back there again? What's the mystery? What's going on down there? What happened down there? Something horrible must have happened down there. So now we're even more into the invitation. We want to go and find out. <clears throat> Micah goes to Cannon Beach, intending to sell the house and keep his past buried. But the 9,000 square foot home instantly feels like it's a part of him. I'm giving you the what there. Then he meets Sarah Sabin at the local ice cream shop. Maybe Cannon Beach can be the perfect weekend getaway. Now I'm giving you, a, again, a little hint at age, because if he's got this gal that he's interested, he's, he's probably not in his middle age. He's probably a little bit younger than that. Then I say, but strange things start happening in the house. Again, I give you a what. What strange things? What's going on there? What's that house all about? Things Micah can't explain. Things he can barely believe. All the locals will say is the house is spiritual. Again, I'm intriguing now with the what question. What about it spiritual? Why won't the locals talk about it? Um, what are the things he can't believe? This is unsettling since Micah's face slipped away like the tide years ago. So now I'm giving you backstory. If you're a Christian, you're going, okay, maybe this guy was following Jesus at one time, but it doesn't sound like he is anymore. I wonder what happened with that. And then the final line, this is the twist. And then he discovers the shocking truth. The home isn't just spiritual. It's a physical manifestation of his soul. Then you're going, Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. And that ties back into my, my headline. What would you find if you walked into the rooms of your soul? That's intrigued you. And then I answer the question that yes, this home is this guy's soul. And at that point you're going, Oh wow. Too strange for me. That you know, too bizarre. Or you're going, Oh my gosh, I have to turn and at least read the few first few pages. Wow. So, sorry that was so quick, but that's, that gives you a little bit of an example. Even to just the language you use, because you're talking about this is on the on the the coast, and then you and you say something like his face slipped away like a tide. Am I remembering that correctly? So it's like using even yeah. that water image and keeping that consistent. So that you know is is brilliant. So you know just just adds to to the um, to the feel of it, I guess. To 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 how you 
and want to portray that story. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Yeah. 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 I do want to get one, one question that Tina asked um, on record before we go off the recording. She said, um, it was when you were talking about your pillars, Jim, of marketing and business and branding. And her question was, how is the business side of writing different from the marketing and branding side? Cool. Question. Yeah, <laughs> the marketing side is that promotes yourself and gains you email readers. And um, how do you do effective uh, ads on Facebook or Amazon or that kind of thing? It's, it's how do you brand yourself in every way and everything you do? It's what should your website look like? Um, it's how you stand out. Whereas business, the business side of publishing is how do you deal with the ad editors? How do you deal with agents? How do you deal with contracts? How do you work if you're an indie author? How do you how do you develop? How do you work with a back cover designer and a copy person and an editor and all these kind of things? Um, how do you essentially, if you're going to be an indie author, you have to have the mindset of I am a small business, yeah. and that's a that's a big shift. And how do you protect yourself? Um, I've been fortunate that I've owned my own business since '94, I guess, and so. I learned a lot of these things, again, just by being in another business, and I was able to bring that over to the publishing industry. But there's a lot of writers who say, I, wow, I work for somebody, but I never ran a business. How do I run a business? How do I run this writing business? So it's really specific to all the pitfalls and things you need, need to know to run a business. <clears throat> Well, this has been really great. And we are getting close to the top of the hour. So if everybody wants to pop on just really quick, and if you have a you know, specific question you want to ask, we'll give you the opportunity to do that. Um, if you need help getting on, we'll try to work our magic to make that happen. <laughs> you just got a link. Jim, do you want to um, share about the link you just put in there? Yeah. So I just put a link in the chat. And this is something that I'm going to offer all of your viewers for free and, yeah and uh, it, it really this I, I wish i could take credit for this but it's really my son um that suggested this and he said you know dad you, you can't do an hour consultation with everybody but you could do 15 minutes and you could just help people out and do the mentor thing because i really love mentoring people i i was so fortunate to have some great mentors when i was starting out so what that link is if you would like to have a free, no obligation at all, 15 minute consultation with me on my cover copy or anything to do with your career, all you got to do is click that link. It'll take you to a website where you can put in um, a day and a time that will work for you. And then I'll call you and we'll talk about anything you want to talk about. From experience, <laughs> Jim's calls are fantastic. They are. <laughs> all of you get on his calendar right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I clicked on that link right away. Do some follow up. Um, all right, anybody have a have a question or comment or anything? Raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody after all of that. All right. Well, then we're going to stay on for the after party just for a few more moments. Um, again, we thank everybody for being here. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim, for being such a wonderful guest and covering so much territory with us and for us. If you're watching the replay, we're, we thank you for that and invite you to actually join us live every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 Central, here at Writer's Chat. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.